Good evening. I am Lector Finn J.D. John of the Friedrich Wilhelm von Jun's Library of Forgotten Worlds in Dusseldorf, and I am proud and pleased to bring you tonight's reading from the library's collection. We are continuing with Under the Moons of Mars, also known as A Princess of Mars, by Edgar Rice Burroughs, the 1912 travelogue of Mr. Burroughs' uncle, John Carter of Mars. Let us begin. Chapter 13 Lovemaking on Mars Following the battle of the airships, the community remained within the city for several days, abandoning the homeward march until they could feel reasonably assured that the ships would not return, for to be caught on the open plains with a cavalcade of chariots and children was far from the desire of even so warlike a people as the Green Martians. During our period of inactivity, Tars Tarkas had instructed me in many of the customs and arts of war familiar to the Tharks, including lessons in riding and guiding the great beasts which bore the warriors. These creatures, which are known as Thotes, are as dangerous and vicious as their masters, but once subdued, they are sufficiently tractable for purposes of the Green Martians. Two of these animals had fallen to me from the warriors whose metal I wore, and in a short time I could handle them quite as well as the native warriors. The method was not at all complicated. If the Thotes did not respond with sufficient celerity to the telepathic instructions of their riders, they were dealt a terrific blow between the ears with the butt of a pistol, and if they showed fight, this treatment was continued until the brutes either were subdued or had unseated their riders. In the latter case, it became a life-and-death struggle between the man and the beast. If the former were quick enough with his pistol, he might live to ride again, though upon some other beast. If not, his torn and mangled body was gathered up by his women and burned, in accordance with Tharkian custom. My experience with Wula determined me to attempt the experiment of kindness in my treatment of my thoats. First I taught them that they could not unseat me, and even wrapped them sharply between the ears to impress upon them my authority and mastery. Then by degrees I won their confidence in much the same manner as I had adopted countless times with my many mundane mounts. I was ever a good hand with animals, and by inclination as well as because it brought in more lasting and satisfactory results, I was always kind and humane in my dealings with the lower orders. I could take a human life, if necessary, with far less compunction than that of a poor, unreasoning, irresponsible brute. In the course of a few days my thoughts were the wonder of the entire community. They would follow me like dogs, rubbing their great snouts against my body in awkward evidence of affection, and respond to my every command with an alacrity and docility which caused the Martian warriors to ascribe to me the possession of some earthly power unknown on Mars. "'How have you bewitched them?' asked Tars Tarkas one afternoon, when he had seen me run my arm far between the great jaws of one of my thoats which had wedged a piece of stone between two of his teeth while feeding upon the moss-like vegetation in our courtyard. "'By kindness!' I replied. You see, Tars Tarkas, the softer sentiments have their value, even to a warrior. In the height of battle, as well as upon the march, I know that my thoughts will obey my every command, and therefore my fighting efficiency is enhanced, and I am a better warrior for the reason that I am a kind master. Your other warriors would find it to the advantage of themselves as well as of the community to adopt my methods in this respect. Only a few days since, you yourself told me that these great brutes, by the uncertainty of their tempers, were often the means of turning victory into defeat, since at a crucial moment they might elect to unseat and rend their riders. Show me how you accomplish these results, was Tars Tarkas' only rejoinder. And so I explained, as carefully as I could, the entire method of training that I had adopted with my beasts, and later he had me repeat it before Larquist Potomal and the assembled warriors. That moment marked the beginning of a new existence for the poor Thotes, and before I left the community of Larquist Potomal I had the satisfaction of observing a regiment of as tractable and docile mounts as one might care to see. The effect on the precision and celerity of the military movements was so remarkable that Lorquist Potomo presented me with a massive anklet of gold from his own leg as a sign of his appreciation of my service to the Horde. On the seventh day following the battle with the aircraft, we again took up the march toward Thark, all probability of another attack being deemed remote by Lorquist Potomo. During the days just preceding our departure, I had seen but little of Dejah Thoris, but I had been kept very busy by Tars Tarkas in my lessons of the art of Martian warfare, as well as in the training of my thoats. The few times I had visited her quarters, she had been absent, walking upon the streets with Sola or investigating the buildings in the near vicinity of the plaza. 
I had warned them against venturing far from the plaza for fear of the great white apes, whose ferocity I was only too well acquainted with. However, since Wula accompanied them on all their excursions, and as Sola was well armed, there was comparatively little cause for fear. On the evening before our departure, I saw them approaching along one of the great avenues which lead into the plaza from the east. I advanced to meet them, and telling Sola that I would take the responsibility for Deja Thoris's safekeeping, I directed her to return to her quarters on some trivial errand. I liked and trusted Sola, but for some reason I desired to be alone with Deja Thoris, who represented to me all that I had left behind upon earth in agreeable and congenial companionship. There seemed bonds of mutual interest between us, as powerful as though we had been born under the same roof rather than upon different planets, hurtling through space some forty-eight million miles apart. That she shared my sentiments in this respect I was positive, for on my approach the look of pitiful hopelessness left her sweet countenance to be replaced by a smile of joyful welcome as she placed her little right hand upon my left shoulder in a true red Martian salute. Sarkocha told Sola that you had become a true Thark, she said, and that I would now see no more of you than of any of the other warriors. Sarkocha is a liar of the first magnitude, I replied. Notwithstanding the proud claim of the Tharks to absolute verity, Dejah Thoris laughed. I knew that even though you became a member of the community, you would not cease to be my friend. A warrior may change his metal, but not his heart, as the saying is upon Barsoom. I think they have been trying to keep us apart, she continued. For whenever you have been off duty, one of the older women of Tars Tarkas retinue has always arranged to trump up some excuse to get Sola and me out of sight. They have me down in the pits below the building, helping them mix their awful radium powder and make their terrible projectiles. You know that these have to be manufactured by artificial light, as exposure to sunlight always results in an explosion. You have noticed that their bullets explode when they strike an object? Well, the opaque outer coating is broken by the impact, exposing a glass cylinder almost solid in the forward end of which is a minute particle of radium powder. The moment the sunlight, even though diffused, strikes the powder, it explodes with a violence which nothing can withstand. If you ever witness a night battle, you will note the absence of these explosions, while the following morning the battle will be filled at sunrise with sharp detonations of exploding missiles fired at the preceding night. As a rule, however, non-exploding projectiles are used at night. Footnote. I have used the word radium in describing this powder because in the light of recent discoveries on Earth, I believe it to be a mixture of which radium is the base. In Captain Carter's manuscript, it is mentioned always by the name used in the written language of helium and is spelled in hieroglyphics which it would be difficult and useless to reproduce. End footnote. While I was much interested in Deja Thoris' explanation of this wonderful adjunct to Martian warfare, I was more concerned by the immediate problem of their treatment of her. That they were keeping her away from me was not a matter for surprise, but that they should subject her to dangerous and arduous labor filled me with rage. Have they ever subjected you to cruelty and ignominy, Deja Thoris? I asked, feeling the hot blood of my fighting ancestors leap in my veins as I waited for her reply. Only in little ways, John Carter, she answered. Nothing that can harm me outside my pride. They know that I am the daughter of ten thousand Jeddaks, that I trace my ancestry straight back without a break to the builder of the first great waterway, and they, who do not even know their own mothers, are jealous of me. At heart they hate their horrid fates, and so wreak their poor spite on me, who stand for everything they have not, and for all they most crave and never can attain. Let us pity them, my chieftain, for even though we die at their hands, we can afford them pity, since we are greater than they, and they know it. Had I known the significance of the words, my chieftain, as applied by a red Martian woman to a man, I should have had the surprise of my life. But I did not know at the time, nor for many months afterwards. Yes, I still had much to learn upon Barsoom. I presume that it is the better part of wisdom that we bow to our fate with as good a grace as possible, Deja Thoris, but I hope nevertheless that I may be present the next time that any Martian, green, red, pink, or violet, has the temerity to even so much as frown on you, my princess. Deja Thoris caught her breath at my last words and gazed upon me with dilated eyes and quickening breath, and then, with an odd little laugh which brought roguish dimples to the corner of her mouth, she shook her head and cried, What a child! A great warrior, and yet a stumbling little child! What have I done now? I asked in sore perplexity. Some day you shall know, John Carter, if we live, but I may not tell you. And I, the daughter of Mors Kajak, son of Tardus Mors, have listened without anger. So she soliloquized in conclusion. 
Then she broke out into one of her gay, happy, laughing moods, joking with me on my prowess as a Thark warrior as contrasted with my soft heart and natural kindliness. I presume that should you accidentally wound an enemy, you would take him home and nurse him back to health, she laughed. That is precisely what we do on Earth, I answered, at least among civilized men. This made her laugh again. She could not understand it, for with all her tenderness and womanly sweetness she was still a Martian, and to a Martian the only good enemy is a dead enemy, for every dead foeman means so much more to divide between those who live. I was very curious to know what I had said or done to cause her so much perturbation a moment before, and so I continued to importune her to enlighten me. No, she exclaimed. It is enough that you have said it and that I have listened, and when you learn, John Carter, and if I be dead, as likely enough I shall be, ere the next moon has circled Barsoom another twelve times, remember that I listened and that I smiled. It was all Greek to me, but the more I begged her to explain, the more positive became her denials of my request, and so in very hopelessness I desisted. Day had now given away to night, and we wandered along the great avenue lighted by the two moons of Barsoom. With Earth looking down upon us with her luminous green eye, it seemed that we were alone in the universe, and I, at least, was content that it should be so. The chill of the Martian night was upon us, and removing my silks I threw them across the shoulders of Dejah Thoris. As my arm rested for a second upon her, I felt a thrill pass through every fiber of my being, such as contact with no other mortal had ever produced. And it seemed to me that she had leaned slightly toward me, but of that I was not sure. Only I knew that my arm rested there across her shoulders longer than the act of adjusting the silk required, and she did not draw away, nor did she speak. And so in silence we walked the surface of a dying world. But in the breast of at least one of us had been born that which is ever oldest yet ever new. I loved Dejah Thoris. The touch of my arm upon her naked shoulder had spoken to me in words I could not mistake, and I knew that I had loved her since the first moment that my eyes had met hers, the first time in the plaza of the dead city of Korod. That concludes this chapter. I'll be back reading the next chapter of this book two weekdays from today. Until then, good night, and as always, I wish you...